It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. So as the offering is being received, I want you uh, to take your Bibles, if you would, and go ahead and open them up and find Philippians chapter 3. Last week we dealt with verses 1 through 11. And this is kind of like Paul's spiritual autobiography in chapter 3. And last week in verses 1 through 11, he talked about his past. And there we met Paul as the accountant who, who discovered new values when he met Jesus. In our section this morning from verses 12 through 16, Paul's going to be addressing his present. And there he's going to take on the, the terminology of an athlete, one that is pressing forward to the finish line of the Christian race. Next week we'll get to verses 17 through 21, and there we'll meet Paul as the alien, recognizing that his citizenship is in heaven, and he's looking forward to the coming of our Lord. In each of these experiences, Paul is exercising the spiritual mind. The spiritual mind ultimately is when we're able to look at the things of this earth from a heavenly perspective. I think it's interesting that throughout Paul's letters, he uses many illustrations uh, to communicate truths about the Christian life. For instance, in Ephesians chapter 6, he uses the military as an illustration where he says to put on the whole armor of God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and chapter 6, he takes on the architectural uh, illustration where he says that your bodies are a temple of God. In Galatians chapter 6, he uses an agricultural illustration where he tells us that uh, whatever you sow, that you'll also reap. Now, in our text this morning, he's going to use an athletic illustration. So, let's read our text first, and then we'll kind of zoom in on a couple of verses. I'll begin in verse number 12. There Paul writes, and he says, Not that I've already obtained this, or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own. Because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. I press on towards the call for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way. And if anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. Now, backing up there in verse number 13, it says, I I do not consider that I made it my own, but one thing I do. I want to focus on the one thing today. Throughout the scriptures, we see that phrase used many different times. One thing. To the self-righteous young man in Mark chapter 10, Jesus says, the one thing that you lack is to go and sell all that you have and give to the poor. Jesus says one thing is necessary, as he explains to a busy Martha who's frustrated with her sister Mary in Luke chapter 10. One thing that I know, I once was blind, but now I see, was exclaimed by the man in John chapter 9. The psalmist writes in Psalm chapter 27, verse number 4, One thing I have asked of the Lord, and that I will pursue, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. One thing. My observation and my personal opinion is simply that too many Christians are too involved in too many things. When the secret of progress And the secret to success is to concentrate on the one thing. Think about our athletes. No athlete succeeds in everything they do or every position on the sport in which they play. They succeed by specializing, by focusing, and mastering the one thing. Now, in his book, John Maxwell writes a book called Developing the Leader Within You. There he explains why animal trainers carry a stool with them when they enter into a lion's cage, like the picture behind me. 
they'll carry this stool with them for a purpose. It'll get there. And there it is. They carry it for a purpose. Yeah, they might have a whip with them. They, they often will have a pistol at their side in the case of extreme emergency. But their most effective tool at their disposal is that stool in which that man holds. He holds it by the seat end so that the legs face the lion. And those that know will tell you the reason why that is so successful and effective is that the lion tries to concentrate on all four of the legs. And because he tried to concentrate on four things at once, they begin to uh, become tame and mild. They kind of take on this paralysis because their concentration is fragmented. They're not, they're not able to focus on the one thing. Now, I think we get a, a great picture from this on why focusing on too many things at once will never lead to success. I love what Mozart once said. He said, the shorter way to do many things is to do only one thing at a time. So now go back to our text in verse number 13. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own. In other words, he's saying, look, I'm not there yet. I'm a work in progress. I haven't obtained this fully. But then he goes on to say, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. He says, the one thing that I do begins by forgetting, forgetting. Now please keep in mind, in the Bible, that term forgetting does not mean to fail to remember. Apart from senility, hypnosis, or some type of brain malfunction, we do not have the ability to forget the past. We may wish that we could erase certain painful memories of the past from our lives, but we can't. To forget, according to the Bible, does not mean to fail to remember. To forget means to no longer be influenced by and to no longer be affected by. So uh, when God promises in Hebrews chapter 10, verse number 17, that I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more, he's not saying, hey, I'm going to choose to have a bad memory on that day, because he can't. His memory's perfect. He knows all things, past, present, and in the future. What he is saying is that that sin will no longer be held against you. That sin will no longer affect our relationship together. That's what it means to forget. See, far too often we buy into this, uh, this misteaching that tells us, well, in order to forgive someone, you must forget. And if you haven't forgotten, then you've never truly forgiven. That's not true. To forgive a person for the things that they've done to you, what they've said about you, how they've harmed you or someone that you know, someone that you love, to forgive that person simply means that you no longer allow that instance to affect your relationship with them. You no longer hold that sin against them. That's what it means to forgive. Let me let you in on a little insight here. As God's children... We're commanded to always forgive. Always. Every single time we forgive. We say we're no longer going to hold that against you. It's no longer going to be able to affect our relationship. And we move forward. So forgetting those things which are behind simply means we break the power of the past by straining and striving forward live for the future now keep in mind that i believe that the universal goal of all of our lives is quite simply to know god and to make him known the, that, that should be the the motivating force behind who we are and what we do is a desire to know god more and to make him known by more but in order for us to be able to do that, we must put forth great effort 
to reach that goal. Sometimes we might even need to implement what has been uh, phrased before as planned neglect. In, in that same book by, by John Maxwell, that developing the leader within you, he tells of the story of a very young and successful concert violinist. And, and when somebody interviewed interviewed her about her success and and asked her hey tell us how did this happen for you what's your secret she replied it was planned neglect listen to her words she said when I was in music school there were many things that demanded my time when I went to my room after breakfast I made my bed straightened the room dusted the floor and did whatever else came to my attention then I hurried off to violin practice I found I wasn't progressing as I thought I should, so I reversed things. Until my practice period was completed, I deliberately neglected everything else. That program of planned neglect, I believe, accounts for my success. Now, I think we have a tendency to admire that kind of dedication and devotion in almost every realm of life except for the spiritual realm. When, when someone shows that type of dedication and commitment in, in terms of athletics, in, in, in the world of business, in, in science, or in music, or, or drama, I think we have a tendency to look upon that type of determination and, and kind of applaud and approve. Ah, but when someone begins to demonstrate that type of determination, in the area of Christian living, I think if we're not careful, we're inclined to dismiss them as some type of radical or some type of fanatic. Let me ask you something. Why do those who are focused intensely on knowing God and making Him known, why do those people tend to bother us at times? Could it be that it's because that they remind us that our priorities aren't where they're supposed to be? Again, I think our unifying focus and goal of our lives, according to Scripture, is to know God and to make Him known. So Paul says, I don't consider that I've made this my own, but the one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and then straining forward to what lies ahead. And here we get our athletic term that Paul uses in this verse. It's in that phrase, straining forward. Uh, That means a a runner stretching for the finish line. You know, you've seen the races, chest out, arms back, really leaning into it. See, Paul vigorously lived a life of purpose. And he... He had a great intensity about him. Now, before he met Jesus, his intensity was in the wrong thing. His intensity was in a work-based pursuit of righteousness that can never be obtained. But after meeting Jesus, and after taking the inventory of his life, and seeing that with him all things are better, his intensity didn't go away. No, but the motive behind his intensity, well, that changed. His motive was no longer on this work-based pursuit of righteousness, but was motivated in faith, his righteousness, to go and to pursue gospel service and sacrifice so that other people could, could know more about the Father. Now, in verse number 14, he says, I press on towards the goal for the prize of the upper call of God in Christ Jesus. And that phrase, I press on, that was a a hunting term. That that means to pursue an animal. Now now Paul says he's on the hunt. He's on the pursuit. Now he's not on the pursuit for salvation because he already received salvation. That was God's gift. That's not something that he could manufacture on his own. But his pursuit ultimately was for maturity, was in Christ-like maturation. And notice Paul says, I don't consider that I've already made it my own. I've not reached the goal. I haven't reached a level in my life where I can look around at others and say, ha-ha, I've made it. 
I've now maxed out on my Christ-like maturation, and I'm good, and I'm done. He doesn't reach that point. He says he's still pressing on. He's still straining forward, striving to know God better, to know him more, to know him deeper, and to seek to share that knowledge with other people so that they might come to know God in a very personal way. Paul strove to be mature in Christ, but he knew that he often fell short of Christ-like maturity. He knew that there was always room for improvement. The same zeal that Paul once employed in persecuting the church, well, he now displays in serving Christ. Which brings the question, wouldn't it be wonderful if Christians put as much discipline and determination into their spiritual life as they do in other aspects of their life. If they were as disciplined and determined to grow in Christ-like maturity as they were in perfecting their fishing skills, their golfing skills, their hunting skills. Did I cover enough of you to get you mad at me? I don't know. Wouldn't it be awesome if we as believers would work as hard, if not harder, to confess and repent from our own sins as we do in calling out the sins of other people? If we just recognize ourselves, hey, it's not like we've reached the area of perfect Christ-like maturation. We've got room to grow and mature. So let's strive forward, forgetting the things that are in the past, pressing on to what lies ahead. Let's work to grow and to develop in Christ-like maturation so that God could be made known in our community. Now the believer with the spiritual mind realizes that God must work in them if they're ever going to win the race. Jesus said himself in John chapter 15, verse number 5, without me, you can do nothing. Nothing. So God works in us so that ultimately God can work through us. So there's work that needs to be done in all of our lives because none of us are perfect in Christ-like maturity. So God continues to do the work in us so that he can prepare us so that he can effectively work through through us so that other people can come and know the Savior the way that we do. Now, I think the passage that we look at this morning is more than remarkable because in this section, we meet Paul taking an inventory of his present life using the terminology of an athlete, and he's saying, look, I'm pressing forward towards that finish line of the Christian life. I mean, I'm not going to quit. I'm not going to give up. I'm going to go all out till the very end without delay, without hesitation. I'm all in. Now, Paul, he strove with that desire and that intensity for, for Christ-like maturity. And he knew that he fell short of it. He knew that there was always room for improvement. But think about it for a moment. At the time that Paul wrote this letter, he had been a believer for nearly 30 years. 30 years. And in that time, he has experienced many spiritual successes or achievements, if you will. He knew God so well that he could pen letter after letter filled with spiritual truth, truths that have overwhelmed and awed the greatest theological minds century after century. Paul, the one who could stare death face to face without flinching, and yet here he says he's still straining to know Jesus more. And he has that deep desire to know God in, in, in a deep, personal way. And when I look at this, and I see the example that Paul is setting, then it begins to humble me and think, what's wrong with me? Why don't I have, at times, that same type of intensity in my own life? Uh, surely I've not a, a, attained a level on equal standing with Paul. 
Oh, I'm way behind his example. I've got so much growth that I know needs to happen in my life. But I often wondered, like, in my own life, I get it. Uh, There are times and there are seasons where I would have done well to implement some planned neglect in my own life. Life kind of gets away, doesn't it? You have good intentions. You want to be involved in church. You want to study the Bible more. But then all these other things start to happen. And we just say, well, that's just life. It just kind of happens. Before you know it, it's been 20, 30, 40 years, and you're no more deeper in your knowledge of the Word of God than you were 40 years ago. What's wrong with us? What's it going to take for us to, to wake up and to engage with God's living, active, holy Word? To value this book over every other book that ever has existed. To know God deeply. Do you know more about God today than you did last week? Last year? Ten years? Where are you in your growth and your development of knowing God? I'm going to give you the secret of knowing God. The secret to knowing God is in knowing His Word. That's it. You want to know more about God? Then get into His Word. Stop getting into his word as an afterthought. Start implementing some planned neglect in your life so that you can get into this word. Get up earlier. Don't eat breakfast. Don't get dressed for work. Whatever you have to do until you get into the word of God. And maybe you're not a morning person. I'm not. So maybe that means don't eat lunch or don't have dinner or, or, or whatever. Don't watch a football game until you spend as much time in God's Word as you did watching the football game. I was speaking to myself on that one. I'm not talking to any of you. I love football season. But sometimes I'll do. I'll have a tendency to put other things off just so I can watch a game that means nothing. Man, stop preaching too much. I know, I'm, not, I'm like stepping on your toes, not my toes. How much do you know his word? How deep is the desire to know his word in your life? Do you live with the purpose and the intent to pursue knowing God? And listen, I said, this is the secret. The word of God is the secret. Quit relying on secondary sources to tell you about God when all you got to do is to go to God's own word, his own revelation about himself so that you can discover who he is. So so many times we spend so much time reading what other theologians or other pastors or other authors, what they have to say about what God says. When you need to just get into his word, I'm not saying that those things don't have their place They do. But when you spend more time reading what other people have to say instead of reading what God says, then there's a problem. Allow the Spirit of God to illuminate, to make known, to reveal, to point out, to guide you. And use other resources secondary, but don't put all of your attention into secondary resources when we've got the greatest resource available. One thing, Paul says, this one thing that I do, forgetting the past, I'm not going to allow that to affect me, I'm not going to be controlled by that, and I press on towards the future, straining and striving to reach the finish line. What's your one thing? Do you have a one thing? I, I think about Dwight L. Moody. Dwight L. Moody, one of the greatest evangelists in Christian history. Dwight L. Moody, before the Chicago Fire of 1871, he was involved in a a multitude of good things. I mean, he was involved in Sunday school promotion. He was involved with the YMCA. He was involved with evangelistic meetings. He was involved in many, many other organizations and and, and things that that were good. It's not like they were bad or evil. They were all good. But here's the thing. He was involved in a whole lot of different things. And then the Chicago fire happened. And then God got a hold of him. 
And, and then Dwight L. Moody took this thing personal, this one thing that I do. And so he eliminated everything else in his life, and then the one thing that he did was evangelistic meetings. And that's what he focused on, evangelism. And thankfully, because of his pursuit of the one thing in his life, millions of people heard the gospel. But he never would have been able to do that as successfully as he did had he stayed committed to all these other things. And again, all those other things were good things. They weren't evil things. They were unrighteous things. There were a whole bunch of good things. But when you're involved in a whole bunch of good things and you're not narrowly focused on the one thing that God's called you to, you're missing out. You're missing out. What's the one thing for you? Like, I got my one thing. I understand it. What's your one thing? Do you know? Are you aware? God's word will point you to it. It will give you insight. It will help you to discover that. And as a church, we'll help you. We'll, we'll encourage you. We'll equip you. We'll educate you. Ultimately, so that you can be released to pursue the one thing that God's called you to pursue and to commit your lives to. What's your one thing? Do you know? Do you care? Let's pray. Father. Help us. Help us to, to narrowly focus on the one thing that needs to take priority in our lives. Far too many of us are, are involved in too many good things, but we're not narrowly focused on the one thing. So God, help us. Help us to know the one thing that you've called us to. God, help us to understand who we are in Christ. God, help us to know the sin that's in our lives that dishonors you, that, that, that frustrates our, our walk with you. And God, may we spend time diligently searching and inventorying our lives so, so we can know what it is that we need to confess and repent from. In this time of invitation, Father, may your spirit move among us May the decisions and the, the, the actions that we take from this point on, may it bring glory to your name. Help us in this time. Be pleased by what you see. In Christ's name I pray.